Hare Krishna, dear devotees, welcome. Uh, so today we have our meeting number 30, and today we have two chapters, 323 uh, and 324. Uh, so these are the two chapters that described the married life of Kardama Muni and Devahuti. And this chapter, it has a lot, these two chapters, it has a lot of uh, instructions and guidance, you know, about you know, the ideals of family life in Krishna consciousness. Of course, it may not always be possible for us to follow these ideals, to, you know, be like, be ideal. But at least if we understand the ideal, that's already, you know, a, a step on the right direction, right? So it starts, it starts by understanding what is the goal. It's okay. So we start from here. So, uh, before narrating the explanation given by Lord Kapila, right, in the Sankhya philosophy, uh, uh, Maitreya described the family life of Kardama Muni and Devahuti. Because, of course, Kapila Muni is a consequence of this family life, right? So these are chapters 23 and 24. So one may question, you know, why Srimad Bhagavatam describes their family life? Uh, instead of focusing on the teachings of Lord Kapila. But the obvious answer is that Bhagavatam describes it because it is actually not less important. The family life of Kardama Muni is not only pure, right, conducted, uh, conducted with the purpose of bringing a ray of Vishnu, right, an, an incarnation of the Lord, uh, no, someone in, a, a pure devotee of the Lord who could benefit the entire universe, but also it's a great example for us, right? Illustrating the values that are essential for a spirit for a spiritually conducive uh, family life. It's not possible for us to imitate the austerities of Kardama Muni and Devahuti, nor it's, is it recommended, uh, but we can learn from their example, right? Haribo. So then uh, we have next slide. Lessons about family life in Krishna consciousness. So uh, Parvati and Lord Shiva, they are very, they are the most exalted examples of husband and wife in our universe, right? Because Lord Shiva is the perfect Vaishnava and Parvati is the most dedicated wife. Uh, so Lord Shiva lives under a tree and he's completely renounced and Parvati, on the other hand, is a princess, right? The daughter of the king of the Himalayas. And no, she could have selected anyone as her husband. But she chose Lord Shiva. Not because he's a rich man, right? but because of his spiritual position. So similarly, although Devahuti was a princess, she chose Kardama Muni as her husband, even though uh, he was a renowned sage, right? Why? because of his spiritual advancement. She valued, valued her, his sanctity and his spiritual realization, much more than power or money, right? And therefore, after the marriage, she was happy to serve him while he was practicing austerities. And, uh, and this is described in the first verses of chapter 23. So it says there, so Maitreya continued, after the departure of her parents, the chaste woman, Devahuti, who could understand the desires of her husband, served him constantly with great love, as Bhavani, the wife of Lord Shiva, serves her husband. O Vidura, Devahuti served her husband with intimacy and great respect, with control of the senses, with love and sweet words. Right? These are the two first verses of the chapter. So, in his purport, Prabhupada, he gives more detail on the of the relationship between Devahuti and Kardama Muni. So Kardama Muni, he was a highly qualified man, one of the greatest uh, sages in the universe. And Devahuti accepted him as a superior, right? Uh, so she was thus happy in serving him without reservation. And as Prabhupada mentions, uh, in general, the instinct of a man is to be in, in, to be is to be in control, like to pose himself as higher and greater than the wife, and therefore it's difficult to avoid disagreement in the marriage if it's not you know somehow or other observed. So it's just like this is just like psychological principle, right? But it's a kind of a obvious, a kind of a clear point. Uh, now that the, the scriptures speak about. 
So Prabhupada mentions this also. Quote, uh, here two words are very significant. The Ruth served her husband in two ways, Vishrambena and Gauravena. These are two important processes in serving the husband or the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Vishrambena means with intimacy, and Gauravena means with great reverence. The husband is a very intimate friend, therefore the wife must render service just like an intimate friend, and at the same time she must understand that the husband is superior in position, and thus she must offer him all respect. A man's psychology and a woman's psychology are different. As con constituted by bodily frame, a man always wants to be superior to his wife, and a woman as bodily constituted is naturally inferior to her husband. <clears throat> Thus, the natural instinct is that the husband wants to pose himself as superior to the wife, and this must be observed. Even if there is some wrong on the part of the husband, the wife must tolerate it, and thus there will be no misunderstanding between husband and wife. Uh, so, yeah, so like I said, this is like a psychological point, but the Shastras mention it because the idea is that we understand how to conduct or married life so it can be peaceful, right? So continue. Now, uh, old, uh, like, uh, like this is end of the quote. So the natural instinct for any woman is to marry a man who is stronger, more intelligent, more emotionally mature, etc. than her, right? No woman in sane, you know, state of mind will want to marry a man who is, you know, uh, you know, dumb, and immature, and weak, and incapable, and so on, right? Every woman wants to marry a great man, right? Uh, so, therefore, when the man can play this role, then the re this relationship of respect is naturally established, right? When the man is a great man, and the woman, the woman can put herself in this natural position of following him. Of course, the difficulty in Kali Yuga is not all men are great. No, that's the difficulty. But, you know, the general psychology is given here. So this is the ideal situation for Booth, right? Because then the man has the respect of his wife. And because of this, he becomes motivated to grow and develop his potential further. While the wife benefits from receiving protection of such a great man, right? So the husband becomes happy when he can play the whole, the role of a hero, right? And the wife is happy when she can play the role of someone protected by the hero. So in so this is a situation where Booth flourish, right? This is a situation that is good for Booth. Of course, when we speak about Kali Yuga, Things are rarely ideal, right? But this dynamic is still valid. That's that's just how it works, right? Uh, uh, degraded men, they may display qualities such as harshness, infidelity, even violence. And this will make the life of a wife very difficult, right? So therefore, uh, a, a woman should be intelligent to marry some, you know, elevated men, not just not just some degraded men that will display all kinds of bad qualities. And then continue. So uh, the the female of the term sadhu is sadhui, right? So the term sadhu is generally used for a man in the renounced order of life, like especially a sannyasi. While the term sadhui is used in the sense of a chaste wife or a virtuous lady. Interesting, right? The terms, they are used in, in different meaning. Uh, so while a man can achieve perfection by becoming a renouncement, uh, this path is not usually recommended for women. Instead, a lady becomes a sadhui by serving a great husband, like Devahuti, serving Kardama Muni, and taking care of their children. This, however, depends on selecting a qualified man, right? That's the difficult part. Uh, so because the wife is supposed to follow her husband and adopt the same lifestyle for her marriage to be harmonious, uh, in Vedic culture, wom uh, women, they marry men who are of the same class or higher. Not, they never marry some a man that is inferior to them. And 
there was no harm in Devahuti who was a Kshatrayani marrying Kardama Muni, who was a Brahmana, for example. Uh, but the marriage between a Kshatra woman and a Vaisha or a Shudra man would be condemned because it not only results in a disharmonious family life because of the differences in mentality, but it also brings degradation for the woman because then the woman would have to follow the lifestyle of this lesser man. Of course, nowadays there is no such clear division between classes as before, but still the general principle is that a woman should marry a man who is similar in nature or higher, right? But not a man who is inferior. Uh, and then other points that lust, pride, envy, greed, uh, sinful activities and vanity, they are great obstacles for our spiritual advancement. But we can gradually overcome them by practicing the principles of spiritual life and developing an attitude of service, right? So in the case of Kardama Muni and Devahuti, the situation was that Kardama Muni was directly serving the Lord through his advanced uh, devotional practices, and Devahuti was serving him as a dedicated wife. So in this way, both were advancing, right? So, uh, and of course, it's not so easy to have the opportunity of directly serving the Lord, right? personally serving the Lord, but it's easy to serve his devotees. So Devahuti has a very exalted husband, and therefore it was natural for her to serve him. And by doing so, she was advancing spiritually in imperceptible ways, right? Because that's what happens when we serve a pure devotee. We don't see you know, any light coming from the, from the sky or something like that, but we advance in, per, in, in, per, in, per, in perceptible ways. And after some time, we just notice that we just change it so much by this service. Uh, uh, so, and this is indicated in the third verse of the chapter. So it says there, quote, working sanely and diligently, she pleased her very powerful husband, giving up all lust, pride, envy, greed, sinful activities, and vanity. So, Although Kardama Muni was a greater yogi than Devahuti, she uh, now she uh, she was a princess, right? While Kardama Muni, she he was just a poor sage dressed in in rags, right? Mm -hmm. So this could be a reason for Devahuti to become proud, because in one sense she was better than her husband because she was richer, right? She was a princess. Uh, he was just a poor sage. So and so this could be a reason for her to become proud. And this pride could ruin, ruin her family life. And this is explained by Prabhupada in his purport. Prabhupada says, quote, Sometimes it happens that the wife comes from a very rich family, as did Devahuti, the daughter of Emperor Swayambhuva Manu. She could have been very proud of her parentage, but that was forbidden. The wife should not be proud of her parental position. She must always be submissive to the husband and must give up all vanity. As soon as the wife becomes proud of her parentage, her pride creates great misunderstanding between the husband and wife, and their nuptial life is ruined. Devahuti was very careful about that, and therefore it is said that she gave up pride completely. So, unquote. So there is always something that one can do better than another. So there is this interesting pastime from the Mahabharata that when uh, Dronacharya asked uh, Yudhisthira to find someone lower than him, he couldn't because he noticed that even animals could do certain things better than him or that they had qualities that he didn't have. Similarly, a wife may have many reasons to be proud. But if she's not able to control this pride, then this may ruin her family life. Therefore, Devahuti, she was very careful about it, abandoning her pride as a princess and just adopting the same lifestyle as her exalted husband, right? And we, uh, we can see something similar in the story of Gandhari, right? When she heard that she was getting married uh, to Dhritarashtra, who was blind by birth, she decided to voluntarily 
cover her eyes, right? Because she understood that being able to see would make her feel higher than her husband, right? So this is an important point mentioned here. So another point that is mentioned by Prabhupada is that although there were uh, difference, uh, differences in terms of social status, uh, Kardama Muni and Devahuti, they were of the same category because both were yogis capable of controlling their senses and both were great devotees of the Lord, right? So in one sense, they were very different, but in another sense, in the, in the most important senses, they were very, very similar. So therefore, although it was not easy for Devahuti to adopt, uh, to to adapt right, to life in the forest, she was happy to do so because she had the same goals as her husband and she could understand and appreciate his austerities, right? She understood what he was doing and she could value it. So therefore she was very happy in assisting him. And if she had been a materialistic person, her married life will not have been so successful, right? And that's something that Prabhupada mentions that, quote, the wife is expected to be of the same category as the husband. She must be prepared to follow the principles of her husband, and then there will be a happy life. If the husband is a devotee and the wife is materialistic, there cannot be any peace at, uh, in the home. The wife must see the tendencies of the husband, and must be prepared to follow him. So often, uh, uh, ladies, they get the idea of marrying a pure devotee, like, oh, I want to marry a pure devotee. And of course, this is a nice sentiment, but practically speaking, this may not actually be a good idea, unless the woman is also prepared to be a pure devotee, because a materialistic woman will not be able to appreciate a saintly husband. And she will also not be able to benefit from his association. So the differences in mentality will also make their family life very disharmonious, right? And which will also be unfavorable for both. So we can remember, for example, the example of the wife of Srila Prabhupada, like drinking tea with her friends while Prabhupada was lecturing uh, uh, on the Srimad Bhagavatam to guests. And then later, she even sold uh, Prabhupada's books to buy biscuits, right? And so on. So this is an, an interesting example, right? Okay, so then next slide. Begetting a ray of Vishnu, right? Haribo, bringing a pure devotee or an incarnation of the Lord to this world in your family. So usually, uh, usually, when couples, they get married, they spend some time on honeymoon, and then from there, they get settled in, settled in their family life, right? They go on this period of enjoyment, and then they start having children and so on. However, there are a few examples of couples who would follow a different path. They would first uh, perform some very serious austerities, and then after that, they would beget children. And examples are Kardama Muni and Devahuti, Sutapa and Prishni, etc. So being purified by this practice of austerities, they would beget very, very exalted children or, or even direct incarnations of the Lord, just like Lord Kapila and Prishni Garba, right? Prishni and Sutapa, they also begot an incarnation of the Lord, Prishni Garba. So the main goal of Kardama Muni was not just to you know, enjoy his married life, but to beget exalted children who could benefit the universe. So with this in mind, he first practiced austerities, like for many years with his wife, uh, before, you know, before begetting children, he first practiced austerities for many years with his wife. So both of them could become purified. That was the goal. So usually people, they beget children just out of passion, and therefore they just beget you know, regular children who can be trained to be devotees of the Lord. However, when a couple, they beget children while situated in a very high level of purity, often very elevated souls, pure devotees, they come to their family, right? So that's what Kardama Muni, was, Kardama Muni and Devahuti, they were doing, right? 
so okay, so Karnama Muni and Devahuti they were practicing their austerities, uh, and after con uh, concluding these austerities, Karnama, Karnama Muni he became compassionate to his emaciated wife, and he spoke to her her as follows. Then there are there is another quote here. Uh, quote. Uh, O oh, respectful daughter of Swayambhuva Manu, today I'm very much pleased with you for your great devotion and most excellent loving service. Since the body is so dear to embodied beings, I am astonished that you have neglected your own body to use it in, on my behalf. I have achieved the blessings of the Lord in, in discharging my own religious life of austerity, meditation and Krishna consciousness. Although you have not yet experienced these achievements, which are free from fear and lamentation, I shall offer them all to you because you are engaged in my service. Now, look at them. I am giving to you the transcendental vision to see how nice they are. So, uh, uh, end of the quote, right? So, this is a very interesting passage of Srimad Bhagavatam because through his practice of devotional service, Kardama Muni, he had a rising to the highest platform, right? Obtaining love of Godhead. And now, being completely satisfied with the selfless service of Devahuti, he wanted to share this ultimate realization with us, with her, this pure devotional service that he obtained. And normally, it's not expected that a woman may obtain love of Godhead just by serving her husband, right? Normally, these are more or less two separate things. Serving her husband is for happy family life. Love of Godhead, it you know, for, for love of Godhead, she needs to really serve Krishna. But if the husband is a pure devotee like Kardama Muni, then this is possible. Uh, because a dedicated wife shares the results of the pious activities, uh, the pious activities of the devotional service of her husband, and Prabhupada explains this point. A uh, quote, Prabhupada speaks that quote. Devahuti engaged only in the service of Kardama Muni. She was not supposed to be so advanced in austerity, ecstasy, meditation, or Krishna consciousness, but imperceptibly. Uh, imperceptibly she was sharing her husband's achievement, which she could neither see nor experience. Automatically, she achieved these graces uh, of the Lord. By the grace of Kardama Muni, Devahuti experienced actual realization simply by serving. We, we get a similar example in the life of Narada Muni. In her previous life, Narada was a maid servant son, but his mother was engaged in the service of great devotees. He got the opportunity to serve the devotees and simply by eating the remnants of their foodstuffs and carrying out their orders, he became so elevated that in his next life, uh, he became the great, uh, the great personality Narada. By serving, her de by serving her devotee husband, Kardama Muni, Devahuti shared in his achievements. Similarly, a sincere disciple, simply by serving a bona fide spiritual master, can achieve all the mercy of the Lord and a spiritual master simultaneously. Right? So Prabhupada, he makes also this connection between this example of Devahuti and the example of a disciple serving his spiritual master. So this example also teaches us in this direction, how a spiritual master, how a disciple can serve the spiritual master, right? We can also read this pastime of Devahuti and Kardama, serving Kardama Muni and uh, put it in this context. Like this is the perfect example also of a disciple serving the spiritual master. Uh, so we can also learn from this side. So, okay, so Kardama Muni got pure devotional service and he offered to share it with Devahuti, right? He was ready to give it to Devahuti. However, Devahuti had something else in mind. She was more anxious to beget a child from the sage than to obtain love of Godhead. She desired to first beget a child and then be empowered with love of Godhead. So, and of course, this may sound incredibly foolish at first, but actually, this is a natural propensity, especially for women. And we can see that frequently we have the same mentality. We put other, we also put other achievements ahead 
of the main goal of of attaining perfection in Krishna consciousness, right? Often we have this idea that, okay, it will be nice, you know, to one day get love of Godhead, but before that, I have this and this and this to do, right? We also have this mentality. In the case of Devahuti, it actually, there was a reason for her desire to first beget a son, because they were supposed to be blessed with an incarnation of the Lord, taking birth as their son, and she was anxious for that. In our case, however, <laughs> it's, just really, it's really just foolishness, right? In the case of Devahuti, there was a good reason for that. There is significance on that. But in our case, you know, this putting, you know, this pushing away of the love of Godhead is just foolishness, really. Okay, so Devahuti said, quote, My dear husband, O best of Brahmanas, I know that you have achieved perfection and are the master of all the infallible mystic powers because you are under the protection of Yoga Maya, the transcendental nature. But you once made a promise that your bodily union should now uh, shall now fulfill, since children are a great quality for a chaste woman who has a glorious husband. So like, she politely said that, yeah, this is very nice, but actually I want a child. So, okay, so in his purport, Prabhupada mentions also, interesting purport by Prabhupada, quote, uh, she reminded him that for a chaste woman to have a child by a great personality is most glorious. She wanted to be pregnant and she prayed for that. The word three means expansion. By bodily union of the husband uh, and the wife, uh, their qualities are expanded. Children born of good parents are expansions of the parents' personal qualifications. Both Kardama Muni and Devahuti were spiritually enlightened. Therefore, she desired from the beginning that first uh, she be pregnant and then she be empowered with the achievement of Lords of God's grace and love of God. For a woman, it is a great ambition to have a son of the same quality as a highly qualified husband. Since she had the opportunity to have Kardama Muni as her husband, she also desired to have a child by bodily union. And then, next topic, uh, creating the necessary facilities, because, you know, Family life demands, you know, certain facilities, right? So Devahuti wanted a child, but there were a few obstacles for that. So first obstacle is that Devahuti's body was emaciated due to austerities. And therefore she thought that it would not be attractive to her husband. And also she was not in very good health. And also the sattvic atmosphere of the hermitage was also not very favorable for sexual life. Therefore, she asked her husband to make the necessary arrangements for, you know, these problems to be solved. So, interesting detail here. In our current society, the problem is usually that people are too sexually inclined, and therefore people need to learn to restrict it, right? The problem is excess. In Vedic societies, however, it was often the opposite. Often people were so sattvic, right, especially Brahmanas, that they would study the Kama Shastra, the portion of the Vedas that describes arrangements for sexual life, in order to make arrangements to increase their passion and thus get into the pre proper state of consciousness for begetting children. <laughs> Interesting, right? They had to increase. We have nowadays we have to decrease. At that time, they had to increase. So Kardama Muni certainly knew the science, of course. So Deva Devahuti asked him to prepare everything, including uh, improving her health, preparing a suitable house, etc. Right? These are all duties of her husband. And normally, uh, securing a house and all the other things needed to maintain a family is not very easy for a man. But for Kardama Muni, it was not a problem at all. Because just by his yogic powers, he was able to create a flying palace uh, that not only had all necessities, including, you know, nice rooms, furniture, clothes, ornaments, different types of food, servants even, but also it was a palace that could travel to any part of the universe at will. It was not a house, it was not an apartment, it was not a palace. It was a mystical palace equipped with everything needed that could travel anywhere in the universe, right? So, yeah, 
the <laughs> so one quote question how it can be possible that Cardoma Muni could create not only material objects but also people right we can we can understand that okay by mystic power he can create a palace okay the palace can fly okay but then it's described that he created people also he created many servants uh together with the palace so how is that possible so to understand that it's interesting to study the eight mystic perfections that great yogis like Kardama Muni can achieve. And in essence, all these mystical perfections, uh, they come uh, from contact with the Supreme Lord in some of his forms or features. Contact with different form, different features of the Lord brings bring different types of mystic powers. So therefore, pure devotees, they can also often achieve these powers. But the point is that pure devotees are very reluctant to use you know, such mystic powers, even if they achieve it. But anyway, speaking uh, about Kardama Muni, the mystic powers of Kardama Muni. So uh, Krishna is a source of all mystic powers, right? Of course. Therefore, one who is strongly connected with Krishna in any of his aspects, may start exhibiting such powers, just like a bar of metal in contact with fire becomes hot and acquires the potency of burning, right? That's the principle of all mystic powers. They come from contact with Krishna in some of his features, right? So the point is that uh, like supernatural powers, right? Uh, like the problem with mystic powers is that these supernatural powers, they can easily make a person proud and in this way make him fall, right? And yogis are generally conditioned souls and they are anxious to prove themselves. But devotees, they are the opposite, right? Therefore, they, devotees, they are not anxious to acquire such mystic powers. And even if they achieve them automatically as a, as a, as a consequence of their purity and their devotional service, they are very reluctant in using them. Okay, but anyway, with, without further ado, let's speak with the eight perfections. So these mi eight mystic perfections are, one, Anima Siddhi. So Anima Siddhi allows a person to become very small and thus enter into hidden or closed spaces. So just like Paramatma can enter everywhere, a yogi in possession of this power can I also enter everywhere, even inside of a stone, if you want, just like Paramatma. And then number two, Lagima Siddhi. So this perfection may allows one to become very light, and this allow him to fly to different places or even different planets without difficulty. So once uh, in a TV interview after disembarking from the plane, Prabhupada started describing this mystic power. He started describing different ways that this city can be used uh, for flying, right? By using a stick, a carpet, and so on. So when the reporter asked why then he was flying on American Airlines, right? then he was, Prabhupada answered, to be one with you. <laughs> Don't think that I can't, but to be one with you, to be like you, I'm traveling on the plane, right? <laughs> Interesting. So the highest perfection of this city, however, is to be able to fly in space using the rays of the sun. So the rays of the sun, they are like cosmic roads connecting all the different parts of the universe. So by this process, a yogi can go from his planet to the sun and from there reach any other part of the universe. So Prabhupada mentioned on occasion that he was testing this power at night. No, he was traveling in space, like the yogis in his subtle body at night when when his gross body was sleeping. Okay, but anyway, third third mystic power is Mahima Siddhi. So this perfection allows the yogi to increase his size and physical power. So this mystic perfection is often used by demon while fighting their opponents. So Hiranyaksha, for example, he was so powerful that he could assume a form that was many times bigger than our planet to fight Lord Varahadev, right? So Hiranyaksha is an example of a very power uh, of having this mystic power in a very, very high uh, degree. Very, very high quality. Then number four is 
practicity. This is called acquisition. So by this perfection, a yogi can bend space and reality, space and time to reach any distant object. So using this power, a yogi can touch or grab objects from different places or even different planets by bending space and then reaching by just extending his hands. So he can grab a fruit from a tree thousands of kilometers away, for example, or even touch the moon using his finger. Uh, by using this perfection, one can also enter into the senses of others through the predominating deities of the senses. And thus he can like enter into their bodies, see what they see, enjoy what they enjoy, uh, under, uh, uh, hear what they talk, uh, see, uh, you know, understand what they are thinking, and so on. Right? He can enter their bodies with this uh, practicity. He can ac ac acquire anything he desires with this mystic power. And then five is uh, ishitwa siddhi. So by this potency, a yogi can manipulate the subpotencies of Maya. Uh, and thus, he can create any kind of wonderful material object, any anything, anything basically. Like now, we are getting to the really serious mystic powers. So, at the highest level, this perfection can be used even to create planets or to annihilate planets at will. Like a, a powerful, a really powerful yogi, he can do something like that. So, Krishna is a supreme controller. And by mastering this yogic perfection, one becomes a smaller controller inside this universe. He becomes like miniature Krishna, right? Krishna can control everything. And with this power, a yogi becomes like a small control, a smaller controller inside this universe, but also powerful, right? Uh, okay, number five. Then number six is Visitwa Siddhi. So by this power, one can interfere with another's free will, and thus bring others under his control. Uh, so just like Maya can seduce almost practically everyone inside of this material world, by using this CD, a yogi can do similarly. Uh, so Prabhupada explains that Vasitva works like a type of hypnotism that is almost irresistible. Sometimes people who achieve a small degree of this power become use it to become you know, fashionable gurus or speakers who can bring you know masses of people under their control and you know exploit their people for their purposes and so on. This power, however, it doesn't have any purpose in spreading Krishna consciousness because devotional service implies uh, deciding to serve Krishna under his, uh, under one's own free will, right? So if we force people, if we hypnotize people, force them to serve Krishna, this will not really be devotional service. They need to decide themselves. And also by using this Vasitva uh, mystic power, one can, uh, one can also use this power in himself to keep himself above the control of the three modes of material nature. It can be used in two ways. It can be used to control others or to put ourselves over the control of the of Maya, of the three modes of material nature. So it's a very interesting power. Number seven uh, is Prakamya Siddhi. So by this perfection, one can satisfy any desire that he or she may have under the scope of laws of the laws of nature. Uh, so he can enjoy any kind of material object, any acquire any kind of material knowledge, do anything, basically, anything that is possible, anything that is like under material, under the laws of nature, right? Anything that is possible, he can do. So this power of achieving desirable things uh, ha, 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 reaches its highest level in the last city that is called Kama Vasiyatita. And this is a really serious uh, mystic power. Uh, so this last one, Kama Vasaya, oh, Christian, this is such a difficult word. Kama Vasaya Ita Siddhi. So this, uh, so the difference between this Prakamya, right, the previous one, and this Kama Vasaya Ita Asidi is that Prakamya 
allows one to obtain things that are within the scope of physical laws, right? Things that are possible. Uh, Kama Vasaya, uh, Krishna, <laughs> Kama Vasaya Ita allows one to do the impossible, allows him to contradict nature, to contradict the very laws of nature, to do things that are impossible. So Sabari Muni, for example, he was able to change the shape of his body to become a, a young and handsome man. And then after that, expand himself into eight forms to sim simultaneously marry all the daughters of King uh, Mandata, right? So this is one example of use of this power. Not only he became younger, but he became eight. Another yogi used this uh, seed to create a tree that produced men instead of coconuts. So he made a tree that, you know, produced men like coconuts, right? So he didn't have the trouble of getting married, you know, and begetting children, educating children. He started producing men just like coconuts from the tree, right? So that's an example of the use of this power. So you see, it seems that Kardama Muni utilized this ultimate mystic, mystic perfection to create this flying castle for Devahuti because normally a, a castle can't fly, right? And, and, and you know, what to say about going to celestial planets. So this is something that is ordinarily impossible. And apart from the palace and the paraphernalia, he also created uh, like thousands of celestial girls many, many servants to serve the Vahuti. And of course, this means that he created the material bodies, right? Which then were occupied by souls with corresponding mentality. But still, that's a very incredible feat, right? To create 1,000 Apsaras like this, right? Just by mystic power, that's very, you know, amazing. So as you can imagine, one can use these mystic perfections to achieve wonderful things, right? In this material world, enjoy his senses uh, to the highest degree and so on. However, these mystic perfections, they don't help one to become free from Maya. That's the point. And therefore, devotees are usually not interested in these mystic perfections. On the opposite, on the opposite, these seeds are more like a test, a, temp a temptation that can make one fall and become, you know, a separate enjoyer in this material world, right? Instead of becoming free from it. So Kardama Muni, however, being completely in control of his senses, he decided to use these mystic perfections to please Devahuti, right? That's another thing that is unique in this is history of Kardama Muni. Not only he had this power, but he could use these powers without degrading himself, without you know, becoming proud and so on. Okay, so the chapter, the, the chapter 23, it, it, it includes a detailed description of the opulences of the palace, which were extremely impressive, like to put it mildly. <laughs> And you know they had floors made of emeralds, walls made of diamonds, and so on. And even Kardama Muni himself, when he saw the palace, he was astonished. You know, such a wonderful creation. However, when Devahuti saw this opulent palace, she didn't show happiness. On the opposite, she became morose. And Kardama Muni could understand the reason, because after so many years of austerity, Devahuti was wearing a dirty old sari, her hair had become entangled in knots, she was feeling unattractive and apprehensive about entering, you know, such a beautiful palace, you know, in such a state. So no, that's also natural uh, woman behavior. And Kardama said, quote, my dear Devahuti, you look very much afraid. First battle, uh, first, not battle, <laughs> first bait, in the, uh, bin, in the lake Bindu Sarovara, created by Lord Vishnu himself, which can grant all the desires of a human being, and then mount this airplane, right? And this is verse 23, 23. So when Devahuti entered the lake, she was very surprised to see a house inside of it. And with a, th with a thousand celestial girls ready to serve her, 
And just like the palace, this was arranged by Cardama Muni by his mystic powers. And the girl said with folded hands to her, we are your maid servants. Tell us what we can do for you. Right? And then there is another quote here. This is 23, 28 to 30. Quote, the girls being very respectful to Devahuti, Devahuti brought her forth. And after baiting her with valuable oils and ointments, they gave they gave her fine new spotless cloths to cover her body. They then decorated her with very excellent and valuable jewels, uh, which shone brightly. Next, they offered her food containing all good qualities and a sweet, inebriating drink called Ash Ashavan. Then, in a mirror, she beheld her own reflection. Her body was completely freed from all dirt, and she was adorned with a garland, dressed in, in unsullied robes and decorated with auspicious marks of tilaka. She was served very respectfully by the maids. Uh, so then they uh, they then decorated. No, so this is the end of the quote, right? Unquote. So then. They decorated Devahuti with many valuable golden art ornaments and this, in this, and so on. And in this way, the original beauty of Devahuti was fully restored, right? She became like when she married Kardamamuni. So when, and then when she thought of Kardamamuni, she was too, immediately transported back to the hermitage, right? Teletransportation or something. So, this was again a display of Kardama's mystic powers because he was able to read Devahuti's mind and instantly transport her alongside the maid servants using the uh, Prapti CD, right? So see, ex practical examples of use of these mystic powers. So after that, they then entered the aerial uh, mansion and started their honeymoon trip, you know, throughout the celestial planets. Uh, including, you know, the visiting different gardens that surround Mount Sumeru uh, and many other celestial uh, places, right? There is a quote about that also. Quote, in that aerial mansion, he traveled to the pleasure valleys of Mount Meru, which were rendered all the more beautiful by cool, gentle, fragrant breezes that stimulated passion. In these valleys, the treasurer of the gods, Kuvera, surrounded by beautiful women and praised by the Siddhas, generally enjoys pleasure. Kardamamuni also, surrounded by the beautiful damsels and his wife, went there and enjoyed for many, many years. Satisfied by his wife, he enjoyed in that aerial mansion, not only on Mount Meru, but, on, but in different gardens, known as Vaishnambaka, Surasana, Nandana, uh, Puspa, Bhadraka, and uh, Chaitraryacha, and by the uh, Manasa Sarovara Lake. He traveled in that way through the various planets as the air passes uncontrolled in every direction. Uh, uh, coursing uh, through the air in that great and splendid aerial mansion, which could fly as his will, he surpassed even the demigods, right? Unquote. So, although some great sages like Kardama Muni uh, and the four Kumaras and so on, and now Narada Muni, of course, like great sages, Narada Muni, the four Kumaras and so on, they can freely travel throughout the universe. Uh, conditioned souls engaged in fruitive activities, in material activities, all the way up to the demigods, they are restricted in their freedom, right? E uh, even demigods, they're mainly restricted to their own planets and they can travel to other places on only under certain limitations. But by the dint of his purity and mystical perfections, Karnama Muni, he could travel all over the universe without any restriction. Therefore, it is said that he surpa surpassed even the demigods. And this shows that even though apparently enjoying, right, in the company of so many women like Devahuti and all these Apsara servants there, his consciousness remained pure. And this is indicated by the word uh, Vyashana Yechia on verse, on verse 42, right? Interesting. Okay.
traveling through the universe, and now details about the structure of the Vedic universe, a little bit more about cosmology. So in his purport to, to verse 2343, describing the traveling of Kardama Muni, Prabhupada, he gives a lot of detail about the structure of the universe according to the Vedas. So he says that, quote, all the planets are here described as Gola, round. Every planet is round, and each planet is, uh, is a different shelter, just like islands in the great ocean. Planets are sometimes called Dwipa or Varsha. This art planet is called Bharata Varsha because it was ruled by King Bharata. Another significant word used in this verse is Basu Ascharyam, many wonderful things. This indicates that the different planets are distributed all over the universe in the eight directions, and each and every one of them is wonderful in itself. Each planet has its particular climatic influences and particular types of inhabitants and is completely equipped with everything, including the beauty of the seasons. In the Brahma Sanhita uh, 540, it is similarly stated, Vibhuti Binan, on each and every planet there are different opulences. It cannot be expected that one planet is exactly like another. By God's grace, by nature's law, each and every planet is made differently and has different wonderful features, right? Unquote. So that's Prabhupada. So from here, we get the following pieces of information that you can also see on this slide. So first point, although the different planets, they are often called Dwipa, island, or Varsa. Varsa means tract of land. They are actually spheres floating in space. So the usage of the word Dipa or Dwipa or island is thus metaphorical, like it alludes, alludes to the fact that planets are like islands floating in the ocean of space, right? This is what Prabhupada mentioned in his purport. So then B, the term Bharata Varsa refers to our planet, which was ruled by King Bharat, right? That's the second point. Then, third point, planets are dis uh, distributed all over the universe, and each planet is different from each other, from, from the other, right? And it has particular opulences and different types of inhabitants. So each planet is like unique. Each planet has, however, conditions that are specially tailored, specially created, by the necessities of the people who live there. And it, in this sense, each planet is complete because it includes everything necessary for their maintenance, right? So then there are some extra points here from a different source. So in his famous letter for Swarup, for, to Swarupa Damodara, and that's from uh, a letter from 1977, uh, Prabhupada gives his final conclusions about the cosmological model offered in the Vedas, right? That was one of the last statements of Prabhupada on the topic. That's from 1977. That's from the end of his uh, you know, presence in the world. So then in this letter, Prabhupada adds four more details. So uh, one, the universe is like a tree, right? With the roots upwards and the different planets and stars fixed in their respective orbits, right? So the universe is like an inverted tree, and the planets and universes they are sit, um, and the planets and stars they are fixed in different parts of this tree, and the whole thing is moving. Everything has a certain orbits around Dhruva Loka. So E, uh, sec second point, uh, there are different paths leading from one planet to another. Some of, some of them are made of gold, others of copper, etc. These pathways that, that these pathways they allow interplanetary travel. And these paths they're like the branches of the tree. Right? So you have like the tree with different uh, leaves and fruits, and then you have these paths connecting the different planets that are just like the branches of the tree, going in all directions, connecting every, interconnecting everything. And then third point, the whole tree with all the planets and stars rotates around the pole star, right? Dhruva Loka, every 24 hours. And this results in the passage of days and nights. So days and nights are because the whole universe is uh, 
rotating around Dhruva Loka. Simultaneously, the sun has its particular orb orbit going up and down because the sun goes like this, right? So it goes up and down, north and south in the sky. And this results in the passage of the seasons. So this is uh, the final conclusions of Prabhupada about the uh, structure of the, Vedic, the Vedic universe. He didn't say anything different after that. So, how it works, this thing about the orbit of the sun? So, modern astronomy uses a heliocentric model to explain uh, the passage of days and nights as well as the seasons, right? So, in this model, the sun is in the center and the earth goes around it. The Vedas explain the universe based on a geocentric model. Or in other words, it explains the movement of the stars and the sun and the sky according to the perspective of someone looking to the sky, right? So the Vedas describe that our planet is part of Bumandala, and of course Bumandala is a much larger structure that is fixed in the middle of the universe that doesn't move. And Bumandala is very massive, right? It doesn't move, it's fixed. And so the, the art is fixed in this structure, and instead... Uh, the sun and the stars move around it. So, from the practical point of view, both models work, and they both explain the passage of days and nights and seasons and so on. So, from the practical point of view, however, the model offered in the Vedas is more evolved. Why? Because the uh, modern view, it explains only the uh, phys the physical aspects of the universe, while the model of the Vedas explains also the metaphysical aspects of the universe. So the Vedic model is more complete, is more evolved in this sense. Okay, next point, dividing into nine forms. So after showing uh, the whole universe to his wife, like after having his, you know, Honey Moon, they finally returned to the banks of the Bindu Sarovra. They went back to their place, right? So in this way, Kardama Muni showed to his wife that although they were previously living in a cottage on the banks of the river and so on, they could go anywhere and do anything because of the mystic powers that he gained during their long years of austerities, right? So, uh, in other words, the austerities that they performed were due to choice. It, they were a, a sacrifice for a higher purpose and not because of poverty. Right? There is a big difference between these two. So, but now that they were preparing to beget children uh, and fulfill their duties in, in family life, right? So they were living in an opulent palace instead. Right? So you see, everything was coming at the right time. So, quote, after showing his wife the globe of the universe and its different arrangements full of many wonders, the great yogi Kardama Muni returned to his home, to his own hermitage. After coming back to his hermitage, he divided himself into nine personalities just to give pleasure to Devahuti, the daughter of Manu, who was eager for sex life. In that way, he enjoyed with her for many, many years, which passed just like a moment, like unquote. So, it's described that the material desires of a woman are nine times stronger than a man. And on top of that, you know, Devahuti was, you know, very strongly desired children. Therefore, again, Karnama Muni, he used his yogic powers to divide himself into nine in order to, you know, fully satisfy Devahuti. Uh, so, he also used his powers to eliminate hunger, thirst, and any other form of discomfort. And therefore, they could enjoy their sexual activities for 100 years without interruption, right? Haribo, right? That's again because of his mystic powers. So although living in your planet, Kardama Muni and Devahuti, they were living in such a yuga, and therefore their lifespans, you know, they were very long. And then there is another quote here. In that aerial mansion, Devahuti, in the company of her handsome husband, situated on an excellent bed that increased sexual desires, could not realize how much time was passing. While the, co the couple was who early longed for sexual pleasure were thus enjoying themselves by virtue of mystic powers, a hundred autumns passed, like a brief span of time." Unquote. So, the power of expanding oneself into many forms is obtained 
only by the most powerful yogis, right? You remember, that's part of the last of the eight mystic powers. So it allows a yogi to create copies of his material body and thus become many. However, although one can multiply his body, his consciousness remains just one. So he can engage his multiple bodies in a single activity, just like one may perform, you know, different movements with both hands simultaneously, right? So, for example, moving then independently while playing karatalas, for example, right? So this is possible. This is not easy to do, but this is possible. Uh, uh, but still, one will not be able to do completely, you know, different activities uh, simultaneously, right? You uh, So you can do two no, you can move your hands in the uh, like independently, but you know doing the same activity. You can do you know uh, write, and you know uh, I don't know do something else with the other hand simultaneously, right? So uh, so dividing oneself into multiple bodies is thus more or less like having more hands, right? Uh, it's an interesting trick, but it has its limitations. Normally. Even the most, uh, like on top of that, even the most power, even the most powerful yogis, they normally they can divide into up to eight forms, like Saubari Muni. But Kardama Muni, he was so powerful that he could divide into nine to please Devahuti, one more, right, one extra. And as Prabhupada mentions, dividing into nine forms is the absolute maximum a yogi can achieve. Only and only Kardama Muni did that. No one else did that in the you know, known history of the universe. And another purpose of his dividing into nine forms was that he wanted to generate it, to generate many children at the same time, because the Lord had blessed him to beget nine daughters, right? And he decided to divide himself into nine forms uh, and impregnate Devahut nine times and beget nine daughters at a single time, right? That was another exhibition of Kardama's power, right? So in our age, right, begetting a child is a very, very long and complicated process, right? The pregnancy lasts for nine months and sometimes it's not easy to become pregnant. And then af even after that, the children, they take you no know, long time to grow and they demand a lot of care, right? And this is a consequence of the gross type of bodies that we have in our age. And this, of course, is in turn a result of our, our own uh, like low level of consciousness. Uh, the process of begetting children in such a yuga, as well as in the celestial planets, however, is a little different. So the pregnancy there is very quick. And once born, the children, they also grow very fast. Very quickly, they become, they attain the form of uh, a youth, like a young person. And this is possible because their bodies are much more subtle or refined, we can say. And thus, they don't need to pass through a long process of growth and development like the children of our age. So the elevated soul who takes birth in, into such bodies, also they don't forget their past lives like us. And thus they can immediately speak and show other abilities <clears throat> without having to learn from zero, like in our case, right? So it's a completely different you know, grade of level of existence. So in the case of Kardama Muni and Devahuti, their daughters, they were born later in the same day and they quickly grow, grew into girls of married age, right? So it says, it says here on Bhagavatam, quote, immediately afterward, on the same day, Devahuti gave birth to nine female children, all charming in every limb and fragrant with the scent of the red lotus flower. Aribo. And now Kardama Muni prepares to take sannyas. Right? Because now he did his duty, so many children, now he's preparing to leave. So, after begetting their children, Karnama Muni, he prepared to go to the forest, right? As previously agreed. And, of course, Devahuti became very apprehensive with that. So, Devahuti said, My Lord, you have fulfilled all the promises you gave me. Yet, because I am your surrendered soul, you should give me fearlessness also. My dear Brahmana, as far as your daughters are concerned, 
they will find their, their own suitable husbands and go away to their respective homes. But who will give me solace after your departure as a sannyasi? Like, unquote. So in this way, Devahuti asked Kardamamuni to stay a little more until they had a grow-up son who could instruct her in the spiritual science after he left uh, to the forest, right? He asked him to give her this child who could relieve her anxieties. So Shah Prabhupada, he summarizes the whole situation in his purport. He says, quote, A householder is not expected to remain at home for all his days. After begetting his sons and uh, no, sorry, not uh, not begetting. After getting his sons and daughters married, a householder can retire from household life, leaving his wife in the charge of the grow the, of the grow up sons, uh, grow up sons. That is the social convention of the Vedic system. The Vahuti is indirectly asking that in his absence from home, there be at least one male child to give her relief. From her anxieties. This relief means spiritual instruction. Relief does not mean material comforts. Material comforts will end with the end of the body, but spiritual instruction will not end. It will go on with the spirit soul. Instruction in spiritual advancement is necessary, but without having a worthy son, how could the Vahuti advance in spiritual knowledge? It is uh, the duty of the husband to liquidate his debt to his wife. The wife gives her sincere service to the husband and he becomes indebted to her because one cannot accept service from his subordinate without giving him something in exchange. The spiritual master cannot accept service from a disciple without awarding him spiritual instruction. This is the reciprocation of love and duty. Thus, Devahuti reminds her husband, Kardama Muni, that she has rendered him faithful service. Even considering the situation on the basis of liquidating his debt toward his wife, he must give a male child before he leaves. Indirectly, the Vahuti requests her husband to remain at home a few days more or at least until a male child is born. Unquote. So here Prabhupada explains very nicely, right? So before the Vahuti was desirous of children and thus she was not able to accept this love of Godhead that Kardama Muni wanted to transmit to her. However, now that this phase of their lives was finished, Devahuti automatically gained spiritual realization as a result of her previous austerities, and she was ready to, uh, to perfect her spiritual practice. So Devahuti said, quote, Until now, we have simply wasted so much of our time in sense gratification, neglecting to cultivate knowledge of the Supreme Lord. Not knowing your transcendental situation, I have loved you while remaining attached to the object of the senses. Nonetheless, let the affinity I have developed for you rid me of all fear. Association for sense gratification is certainly the path of bondage, but the same type of association performed with a saintly person leads to the path of liberation, even if performed without knowledge. Anyone whose work is not meant to elevate him to religious life, anyone whose religious ritualistic performances do not raise him to renunciation, and anyone situated in renunciation that does not lead him to devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead must be considered dead, although he is breathing. My Lord, Surely I have been so, uh, solidly cheated by the unsurmountable uh, illusory energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. For in spite of having obtained your association, which gives liberation from material bondage, I did not seek such liberation. Right? That's Devahuti speaking. Okay, then we go to the birth of Kapila Muni. Haribo! Right? Uh, starting from next week, we will be studying his philosophy, and now we are studying about his birth. So, Kardama Muni, then he revealed to Devahuti that as a result of her devotional service, the Lord was going to soon take birth as her son and teach her transcendental knowledge, right? Helping her to become free from all material contamination and finally attain 
pure love of Godhead. And more than that, uh, he would make both of his parents glorious by distributing the knowledge of Sankhya Yoga and thus, you know, benefiting the whole universe, like very glorious child. So, okay, so he stayed for some time more with Devahuti. And during this time, they uh, he engaged her in the worship of the Lord. So he was training her to worship. Because before, Devahuti was only serving him. She was not worshiping the Lord directly. Now Kardamamuni was teaching her that. And then finally, after many years, the Lord finally appeared. Haribo. So it's described that he came from Devahuti in the most glorious way, just like a tree, uh, just like a fire comes out of wood in a sacrifice, right? So due to the birth of the Lord, the demigods, they showered flowers from the sky, you know, everyone became satisfied in their minds. And you know, it was such a festive occasion. And Brahma then appeared personally, right? Together with his sons, Marichi and other sages. So he said, my dear son, Kardama, since you have completely accepted my instructions without duplicity, showing them proper respect, you have worshipped me properly. Uh, whatever instructions you took from me, you have carried out and thereby you have honored me. And unquote. So he, Brahma then instructed Kardama to give his daughters in marriage uh, to the great sages, right? So the population of the universe could be increased. So Brahma said, All your thin wasted daughters are certainly very chaste. I am sure they will increase, the, uh, increase this creation by their own descendants in various ways. Therefore, today please give away your daughters to the foremost of the sages with due regard for the girls' temperaments and likings, and therefore spread your fame all over the universe. So, following the order of Brahma, Kardama Muni married Kala to Marichi, Anasuya to Atri, Shraddha to Angira, uh, Vibirbu to Pulasha, Gati to, Pula, uh, to Pulaha, uh, Kriya to Kratu, uh, uh, Kiati to Brigu, Arundati to Vashista, Shanti to Atarva, and these were all sons of Brahma, right? So he all married the girls according to their preferences. So, uh, so before that, Akuti had married Ruchi, Devahuti married Kardama, and Prasuti married Daksha, right? And now the other sons of Brahma they got married. And it's interesting to notice to note that Brahma already populated the universe in the previous steps of creation, right? We studied about that. He created all the different species. So by the time Kardama Muni traveled uh, through the universe on their honeymoon, the universe was already populated by the work of Brahma and also Daksha. Uh, Daksha was already married for a long time by that point. At that point, so the main function of the other sons of Brahma was not just to generate population, but to generate some specially qualified children would perform, you know, great feats and help uh, to elevate the other inhabitants of the universe. So Daksha, he produces many, many species of life, many, many. He's very powerful in producing many varieties of species and populating the whole universe. But Daksha is a materialist, so he can't produce uh, children who are very, very elevated in terms of spiritual consciousness. This is done by the other sons of Brahma. They don't have so many children like Daksha, but you know, they, they have very high quality uh, children, very elevated children. So, for example, Ruchi and Akuti begot, uh, begot Yaga, which is another incarnation of the Lord. Marichi uh, became the father of the father of Kasyapa, who would later, you know, repopulate the universe, you know, great sage also who would repopulate the universe after the devastation at the end of the uh, fifth Mavantara. Uh, Daksha and Prasuti, they begot also 16 extremely qualified daughters, and one of them gave birth to Nara Narayana Rishi and so on. So, right? so then Brahma then spoke about Kapila. So, Brahma said, O Kardama, I know that the original Supreme Personality of Godhead has now appeared as an incarnation by his internal energy. He is the, he is the bestower of all that is desired 
by the living entities, and he has now assumed the body of Kapila Muni. By mystic yoga and the practical application of knowledge from the scriptures, Kapila Muni, who is characterized by his golden hair, his eyes just like lotus petals, and his lotus feet, which bear the marks of lotus flowers, will uproot the deep-rooted desire for work in this material world. Jai. And Brahma also said a few words to Devahuti. Quote, Lord Brahma, told, Lord Brahma then told Devahuti, uh, My dear daughter of Manu, the same Supreme Personality of Godhead who killed the demon Kaitaba is now within your womb. He will now uh, he will cut off all the knots of your ignorance and doubt. Then he will travel all over the world. Uh, your son will be the head of all perfected souls. He will be approved by the acharyas, expert in the and disseminating real knowledge. And among the uh, the people, he will be celebrated by the name Kapila the son of Devahuti. He will increase your fame. Jai. And now, last one, Karnama Muni is blessed by the Lord. Haribo. So after speaking, <coughs> so after speaking, Brahma went back to his abode, right? Went back to Brahma Loka. While his sons, they stayed for some time for the marriages to be celebrated. And then after everything was done, they went back to their for to their respective hermitages with their wives. So Kardama Muni then approached Lord Kapila in a secluded place, and he offered prayers to him. So he addressed the Lord, asking that, that you no, know, having now fulfilled his duties in family life, he asked the Lord that he could be blessed to accept the renounced order of life. And so Kardama Muni, he wanted to wander around the word free from all material entanglements, right? Carrying the Lord in his heart. So Lord Kapila then explained the reasons for his advent. So he said that he came to explain the Sankhya system, which helps one to understand the nature of this material world and become free from material desires, right? Realizing his original position as an eternal servant of Krishna. And this system had been transmitted in the past, but the knowledge had been lost, right? Therefore, the Lord had come to again transmit, you know, the same system for the benefit of great sages and all human beings, right? And then Lord Kapila, he blessed Kardama. He said, quote, Now, being sanctioned by me, go as you desire, surrendering all your activities to me. Conquering unsurm unsurmountable debt, worship me for eternal life. In your own in your own heart, through your intellect, you will always see me, the supreme self effusion soul, dwelling within the hearts of all living entities. Thus, you will achieve the state of eternal life, free from all lamentation and fear. I shall also describe the sublime knowledge which is the door to spiritual life to my mother, so that she can also attain perfection and self-realization, ending all reactions to fruitive activities. Thus, she will also be freed from all material fear. Haribo. So, unquote, right? So, so after the departure of Kardama Muni, uh, Kapila stayed to instruct his mother, right, on the path of self-realization, transmitting to her this theistic Sankhya philosophies, philosophy that is explained in the uh, remaining chapters of the third canto. And as Prabhupada explains in several passages, there are two versions of the Sankhya philosophy. The original version that is that was transmitted by Lord Kapila, right, uh, that we will study, it has the goal of connecting us with the Lord. And this version, uh, this original version of the philosophy is found in the pages of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Right? The other is the atheistic version that was transmitted by the impostor Kapila, who came in the later stages of the previous Dwapara Yuga. Right? So the original Kapila, he came in the beginning of the day of Brahma, long time ago, billions of years ago. The atheist Kapila, he came like recently, in the end of Dwapara Yuga. 
Uh, so by the time of the appearance of Vyasadeva, this atheistic Sankhya had replaced the original philosophy of Kapila. And Vyasadeva, he dedicated an entire section of the Vedanta Sutra to clear the confusion and defeat it, right? Uh, so it is described that Kardama Muni uh, traveled over the art as a sannyasi, right? Giving up all forms of material association, security, all forms of fruitive activities. And by fixing his mind in the Supreme Lord, he gradually became free from false ego, right? He started identifying with his eternal nature as a soul. So he became completely free from material duality. He became equal to everyone. And he was seeing everyone as the spirit soul, right? Not as the body. Internally, he became completely calm like the ocean, right? When it's not agitated by waves. So he became completely self-controlled by this practice. And completely free from material contamination, from conditioned life, he became situated in the self, right? As a soul. Internally, he was performing devotional service to the Supreme Lord. He was seeing the Lord present, not only in his heart, but on everyone's heart. And indeed, he could see that no one was separated from the Lord. So, in this way, he became completely free from both aversion, attraction and aversion to material objects, right? As a result of his uh, pure devotional service. And of course, at the end, uh, Kardama Muni returned back to Godhead. So, one could question, why Kardama Muni left home in search for the Lord if the Lord was right there, right, as his son, right, right there in his home? Interesting question, right? So there are actually several reasons for that. One was that Kardama Muni, he was in Dasya Rasa, and therefore his relationship with the Lord was a servitor, not as a father. So it would be very unnatural for him to stay at home, you know, taking care of the Lord as a son. Second reason was that the doubter, the second reason was that uh, like the doubters, right, uh, Kapila Muni, he quickly grew into adult age. And therefore, having an adult son was proper for Kadama Muni to leave home and take sannyas, right? And this was previously agreed with his talk, uh, in his talks with Manu also. So this was his, so therefore taking sannyas was his duty according to the scriptures. And it was, in, was important for him to follow it, you know, to give a good example to future generations. Like right? imagine, this happened right at the beginning of the universe. So if Kardama Muni will not take sannyas, then no one would want to take sannyas after that, right? So a third reason was that, uh, that was that you know this was the way it was supposed to happen as part of the pastime because Kapila was supposed to instruct his mother in the Sankhya philosophy after Kardama left home, right? So if Kardama Muni would stay, would hang around for more time, it would disturb that also. So see, there are several reasons for that. So okay, so this is it for today. Thank you very much, Hare Krishna. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Grantara Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai.